Hey guys, Mr. B here. Uh, this video is going to be me going through the 9.1 notes. Um, this is basically if you just want to be able to listen to me go through the notes and not have to read them all yourself, hopefully this will help you, you know, kind of like back in the classroom. So um, in this section, it's a little bit of review. We're going to be learning about just naming ions in general. Um, we learned about this in chapter seven on ionic compounds. Um, but this chapter is more specifically on naming them and writing their formulas. So um, it is sort of like learning a new language, sort of like Spanish or Hindi or Chinese, where there's, um, there's different rules um, to writing formulas and, and naming ions and stuff like that. But as long as you know all the rules, um, you can kind of, you know, make it work for all the different things we're going to learn about. So, um, so first off, we're going to learn about monatomic ions. We learned about this in chapter seven. Um, monatomic, monoatomic. So mono means one and atomic means atom. So a monatomic ion is any ion that consists of a single atom that has a positive or negative charge on it. Um, examples of monatomic ions would be like um, Na plus. So that would be a monatomic ion. Or um, O two minus, that would be a monatomic ion. It's a single oxygen atom or a single sodium atom that is an ion, it has a charge on it because it's gained electrons or it's, or it's lost electrons. Um, later on in this chapter, we're gonna learn about things called polyatomic ions. Polyatomic means um, many atoms. So poly means many and atomic means atoms. So a polyatomic ion would be something that looks maybe um, like this. So CO3, two minus. This would be multiple atoms, so a carbon atom and three oxygen atoms, so polyatomic, many atoms, that has a charge on it, so it's an ion. Okay, so this, so this would be considered a polyatomic ion, and these would be considered monatomic. So monatomic ions, and this would be a polyatomic ion. Okay? All right. So, anyway, well, we learned about this already, but... So remember um, that metals make cations, okay? Cations are positive. Remember that cats have paws. Um, when you have elements in groups 1A, 2A, or 3A, so that's columns one, two, or three on the periodic table, they're gonna lose electrons and they will form a positive charge equal to their group number. So all the elements in column one will make a charge of positive one. All the elements in column two will make a charge of positive two. And elements in column three will make a charge of positive three um, or at least two of them will, okay? Boron and aluminum will, but once you go below aluminum, you hit the staircase and you start getting into transition metals, which don't necessarily like to follow those rules. So um, for column three, really just boron and aluminum, the top two will make positive three, but the ones below that don't really like to follow that rule. So do keep that in mind. Um, as for naming positive cations, there is no, like nothing special we have to do. Um, we would name them basically by just naming the metal and then followed by the word ion or cation. So for example, um, we would call Na sodium, this would be a sodium atom, okay, it doesn't have a charge on it. Whereas Na plus would be a sodium ion, okay? So basically when we name ions for metals, we don't do anything special in terms of their name, um, we don't change anything about their name, we just simply name the metal, throw ion on the end of it, or cation. Um, and if it's not an ion, then it would just be an atom, and we'd name it a sodium atom, okay? Um, another example of this one could be like um, Ca2+, plus. so this would be, uh, oh, let's go Ca first, so this would be a calcium atom, whereas Ca2+, plus would be a calcium ion. Okay, so very simple, obviously, the naming system for, um, for metals, there's nothing special. So um, this picture here, again, is showing that we have elements in columns 1A, 2A, 3A. You'll notice here that for 3A, they're just showing aluminum. Boron is the element right above aluminum, so that one counts too. But the ones below aluminum, um, they don't really follow the rule of making a charge of positive 3. So um, don't worry about that. Remember that negative ions um, are make anions. So remember that these are nonmetals, and the charge of these can be determined by subtracting eight from the group number. So for example, um, chlorine, which is found in column seven, would make a charge of seven minus eight would equal charge of negative one. 
okay? So chlorine would have a charge of negative one because it's in column seven, and it's one away from eight. And so it gains one electron, and when it gains that one electron, it gains a negative charge because remember that electrons are negatively charged particles. So when you gain them, you become negative. Um, whereas like nitrogen, for example, is in column five. If we subtract eight from that, we would get a charge of negative three. So nitrogen, again, is in column five. It needs to gain three electrons to get to eight. Um, and we can determine that charge either by going five, add three, get negative three, or five minus eight gives us a negative three uh, that way, okay? Um, remember that anion names have to end in ide, or at least anion names of elements on the periodic table end in ide. So for example, here, this would be considered, this would be called chloride, okay? So not chlorine, chloride. Whereas nitrogen would be nitride. Okay, so we have that ide ending. That's really important to remember. Later on in this chapter, you're gonna learn about polyatomic ions and they have endings like eight and ite. So remembering that elements on the periodic table, non-metals end in ide, will help you to be less confused because later on when you hear like um, sodium nitride versus sodium nitrate versus sodium nitrite, okay? Knowing that nitride is just regular nitrogen will help you to be less confused. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. I would make sure that you don't forget that. So um, these, uh, these group A elements form anions. So um, 5A, 6A, and 7A. These ones here in the middle, these are transition metals. These are not anions. Um, I don't know why they're pictured here, but 5A, 6A, 7A. 5A is negative three, six, this is negative two, and then the ones in seven are negative one. All right. Um, there's a nice little chart here that will help you remember this as well. So this might be something you want to write down in your notes. Um, luckily for you guys, your periodic table has the charges in the corner for you. So um, that's kind of a little bit of a cheat sheet for you to use. Obviously, regular periodic tables don't typically have that. So you can also use your periodic table to remind you. Um, all right, we're going to be skipping past the questions. I have a whole video where I go through all the practice problems. So if you want to know the answers for those, go watch that video later on. All right. Um, transition metals. So first off, we have to understand what are the transition metals and um, how are their charges determined? So um, the transition metals, oh, sorry. The transition metals are the elements that are in the middle of the periodic table or underneath the staircase. So remember that the periodic table, we have um, all of the we have all the metals that are to the left of the staircase. I think this is the left, I think. Anyway, to the left of the staircase. And then remember the staircase divides the metals from the non-metals. So all the non-metals are over here and all the metals are over here. And the transition metals in particular are all the ones in the middle. So those are the ones in the D block, um, as well as the ones that are underneath the staircase. Those, can, those are sort of like transition metals too, okay? The reason why they're called transition metals is the charges that they make as ions change. Okay, they're not set in stone like the other elements are. So they transition between different charges. So um, to determine the charges that transition metals make, it's not that easy. Um, there's no rules that say like, oh, yep, these are positive two and these are positive one because they're in this column. Um, the only way to determine their charge is you have to look at how many electrons they've lost. And a lot of times that will be dependent on what they're bonded with. So we'll take a look at some examples of this in further uh, sections of the chapter, but for right now, we're just going to learn about naming them, okay? So transition metals, a lot of times, will make very colorful um, solutions. Uh, a lot of paints and pigments will um, have transition metals in them. Cobalt, in particular, makes a variety of different colors. Um, titanium is very, uh, very prevalent in things that are white, like toothpastes and paint and stuff like that. So um, a lot of uh, transition metals are found in colored things. In fact, they even show here some, some pigments and a lot of transition metals are um, colored again and used in paints and stuff like that. So um, now when it comes to naming transition metals, there are two systems, okay? There's the stock system and the classical method. The stock system is primarily the one that you're gonna want to know. Um, the classical method is not 
really used that off. I mean, it's used, but it's you don't really need to know it that much. Um, the stock system is really the one that, that's going to pop up that we're going to use a lot. So um, we're going to go over the stock system. It's very simple. Uh, we'll talk about the classical method as well, but you don't need to know it as, well, as much. Um, and both of these systems and names can be found on the back of your periodic table in the bottom right hand corner, right down here, there's a chart um, that has all the different transition metals and all their charges and their stock name and the classical name. So if you're not sure about any of them, you can always look on the back of your periodic table and find them there. All right, so in the stock system, we use a Roman numeral to indicate the charge on the transition metal. Now, the reason why we have to use a Roman numeral is because transition metals, again, make more than one charge. So oftentimes when you have those, comp those elements bonded in a compound, you don't know what the charge is just by looking at it because it could be a multitude of things. So we oftentimes will use a Roman numeral in the name to indicate the charge so that it's very clear, okay? Now, if you don't know the Roman numerals, I would recommend going and looking, like looking them up um, or finding them. But real quick, just to, to help you out, um, Roman numeral one, is an I. Roman numeral two is two I's. Roman numeral three is three I's. Um, and then we get to four, which is an I and then a V. Roman numeral V is five. So an IV is one before five, right? Which would be four. Uh, five is just Roman numeral V. And then six would be V and then an I. So it's five, right? V and then an I for one after five. And then we have VII for seven, and then VIII for eight, and then uh, an X is 10. So nine would be I and then an X. So it's one before 10, which would be nine, and then Roman numeral X would be 10, okay? Um, most likely, like one through 10 is all you need to know. Most, most, poly or most um, transition metals are oftentimes like one, two, three, four, five, and that's about it. Six, seven does pop up here and there. Eight, nine, and 10 pretty much never pops up, but it's good to know them anyway, okay? So for example, here we have copper with a charge of plus one. So the stock name would be copper Roman numeral one ion to indicate that the charge on the copper is plus one. Um, copper uh, two plus would be copper Roman numeral two. And again, the Roman numeral two indicates that the charge on the copper is plus two. Um, yeah. Whereas for the classical method or the classical system, um, instead of using a Roman numeral, we change the root name of the element itself. Okay, and there's two endings. There's an OUS ending. Okay, this one indicates the lesser of the two charges. And then there's an IC ending, and that one indicates the higher of the two charges. Um, most transition metals will make two charges. So like copper, for example, makes plus one and plus two. Iron makes plus two and plus three. Nickel makes like plus one and plus two. So a lot of transition metals will only make two different charges. So this system works really well for naming them because um, usually one of the charges is lower than the other two, in which case um, you would add this OUS onto the element name and that would indicate the lesser of the two and then an IC on the end of the element name to indicate the higher of the two. Now you might be looking at this and go, and seeing cuprous and thinking, well, that's weird. That doesn't sound like copper. Um, cuprous is, is copper's original name. Um, a lot of the elements, their names are based on different languages where they were first discovered, like you know uh, Latin or German or things like that. So um, copper's actual like first name was cuprum. And um, so, if you're looking at a copper one ion, copper one is the lesser of the two because it makes copper two and copper one. So because copper one is the lesser of the two, we would take cuprum, which is the root name of the element, and then replace the ending with OUS to get cuprous. So a cuprous ion is the copper plus one, and a cupric ion would be copper plus two, okay? Um, yeah, again, it's kind of strange if you don't know the original names for the for the you know, transition metals like this, the classical name obviously is a lot more challenging. Um, not to mention, this is harder to do when you have transition metals that make more than two charges. So manganese, for example, makes like four or five or six different charges. Um, so the classical naming system for, for manganese doesn't work so well because there's only two different names. 
but there's like five different ions, right? So you don't have a classical name for every single one. So the SOC system works better for that. So again, you don't really need to know this system that much. Um, it'd be like extra credit if anything, but again, it might pop up in which case, uh, if you do know it, it'll, you know, you'll at least know what it is. So um, this table here has a lot of the different names on them, both the stock name and the classical name. So if you're um, curious about that, you can take a look. This is pretty much the same chart that is on the back of your periodic table in the bottom right hand corner. So for example, here you'll know that iron, again, makes iron two and iron three. The, the stock name is iron Roman numeral two for the iron two ion and iron Roman numeral, Roman numeral three for the iron three ion. And you'll look at the classical name, we see ferrous. And again, that's because iron has a, has a symbol of FE. It, it orig its original name is not iron, it's like ferrium or something like that. So uh, ferrous ion would be the lesser of the two charges, which would be the plus two charge. And ferric would be the plus three charge, that's the bigger of the two. Okay, so again, the classical names typically come from the, uh, the original name of the element, which is like Latin or some other language. Um, it can be confusing. Um, I always found lead funny because lead's, um, lead's uh, original name is plumbum. So we have plumbus and plumbic for lead two and lead four. I just thought that was always a, a funny word. So anyway, that's just my child humor coming to play here. All right, um, so let's take a look at our first example. So it says, um, classify the symbol for the ion formed by each element, classify the ions as cations or anions and name them. Uh, and it says potassium and iodine combine to form potassium iodide and additive to table salt that protects the thyroid gland. Okay, great. So um, we're gonna delete this little salt shaker here because we're gonna need some, uh, some space to do this. Actually, we're gonna to have to insert a text box. Um, if I can figure it out, here we go. We're gonna insert a text box, we can do some typing. Okay, so um, first one, can we uh, not type here? No, we can type, okay, cool. All right, so um, we're gonna write the symbol for the ion form by each element and then classify it as a cation or an anion and name it. So the first one, potassium, has a symbol of K. So symbol of K. Um, when it makes an ion, it's going to be positive one because it's in column one of the periodic table. So it's going to be K plus. Uh, because it's positive, it's going to be a cation. And since it's a metal ion, we don't have to do anything special to its name. So we would just call this a potassium ion. And that'd be it. Okay. Um, for letter B, we have iodine. So that would be I. And it's in column seven. So it make a charge of minus one. Um, because it's negative, it would be an anion. And uh, because it's an anion, we are not going to name it an iodide ion. We have to change that ending to ide. So it's going to be an iodide ion. Okay, again, it has that ide ending if it's a negative anion. And it's a regular nonmetal on the periodic table. Um, for letter C, we have sulfur. So sulfur is S. It's in column six, so it needs to gain two electrons to get uh, up to eight to be an ion. So it's gonna have a charge of two minus. It is negative, so it's gonna be an anion, just like iodine was. And again, we're not gonna call this a sulfur ion because it's, a, uh, it's an anion, so we need to change that ending to ide. And so we would call this a sulfide ion. All right, last one we have is lead. Lead as a symbol of Pb. Now lead is a transition metal, so we can't look at what column it is on the periodic table to figure out its charge, but it is telling us in the problem that it has lost four electrons. So if it's lost four electrons, that means it's going to be a positive four, okay, because it's lost four electrons. Um, it will be a cation since it's positive, and um, so to name this as a metal, it would be a lead ion. However, because it is a transition metal, we do need to have a Roman numeral to indicate the charge on the lead. So in this case, it's a four. So we're gonna put in Roman numerals here, IV for Roman numeral four. And so this would be a lead four ion. And we have to do that because again, lead is a transition metal. It makes more than one charge. We have to indicate the charge on it. We don't have to do that for potassium because potassium is not a transition metal. It only makes one charge, which is positive one. So we don't need to indicate what charge it is because it's always the same charge all the time, okay? All right, moving on. Again, there are other practice problems here, but um, you can watch a video of me going over those ones. So, all right, here we get into now polyatomic ions. Um, 
there's a whole list of polyatomic ions on the back of your periodic table. There's a video I have that you have to watch um, where it will indicate some important ones I think you should know. Um, it'd be a good idea to memorize some of those ones. But um, as stated earlier, polyatomic ions are ions with many atoms in them, and they have an uh, they are an ion overall. They have a charge. So examples of polyatomic ions are like CO3 um, two minus. That would be carbonate. Or um, we can have like PO4 three minus. That would be phosphate. So again, poly means many and atomic means atoms. So many atoms that are together as an ion. So they overall have a charge on them. Okay, um, here's some more examples. So we have ammonium, which is NH4 and a positive charge. Uh, of all the polyatomic ions, ammonium is actually the only one that's positive. Um, most all of them are all negative, um, but ammonium is positive. So that one's kind of a special one. Um, we have nitrate, which is NO3 with a charge of minus one. Sulfate, which is SO4 and a charge of two minus. And then phosphate, which is the one I just gave you before. And that is PO4, three minus. Okay, so these are some very common ones. Uh, they are def they're one of the ones that I had you guys mark um, to start to memorize. So. Um, now, again, there's more than one atom that are bonded together in these ions. You'll notice that most of them have, have names that end in eight or it, okay? They do not end in eyed. So whenever you see eight or it, that should be like red flag in your head that that is a polyatomic ion. So, um, for example, if you saw a, um, if you, you know, for example, we could look at um, iodate, which is a weird one. Um, that has a chemical formula of IO3 um, minus, okay, IO3 minus. Um, if you see this it or eight ending, you should immediately look on the back of your periodic table and look at that chart of polyatomic ions, okay? Don't waste your time looking on your periodic table for iodates and trying to find it and then thinking it's iodine because remember that iodine ends in ide. So iodine would be iodide. Okay, iodate is a polyatomic ion. So it's very important that when you see these two endings that you automatically go, oh, polyatomic ion, look on the back of my periodic table and find it on that list of polyatomic ions. Don't waste my time trying to find it on the periodic table. Okay, very important. It will save you a lot of time and confusion later on in this chapter. So um, that eight ending indicates that it is an anion with a greater number of oxygen atoms. So most, when it has eight in it or eight in it, that indicates that there's oxygen in the polyatomic ion. Most of the polyatomic ions, if you look at them, have oxygen in them. Very few don't, okay? There's only a handful that don't. Um, ammonium is one of them that doesn't, which it doesn't end in eight or eight. Um, cyanide is another one that doesn't. That one also doesn't end in eight or eight, but about 95% of them all have oxygen and they all end in eight or eight. The eight ending is like what I like to think about is like the default one. So if you know the one that ends in eight, like sulfate or nitrate or phosphate or carbonate, then, then you're good because you can add oxygens or lose oxygens from there and the name changes slightly. So if you take one oxygen away from, some, from a polyatomic ion that ends in eight, the ending changes to it. So example of this would be sulfate which has four oxygen atoms in it as SO4, and sulfite, which only has three oxygen atoms, right? We've taken one away, so that eight ending changes to an ite ending. So it's a pretty easy naming system. Um, we also can add oxygens on from the, from the sulfate or remove even more oxygens from the sulfite. So here's a whole kind of like tiered ladder showing you this whole thing. Um, so chlorate, this is kind of like what again, like I, what I like to think about as like the default one, okay? If we remove an oxygen, so actually let's think about this. Uh, yeah, so if you remove an oxygen, so minus one oxygen, we change that chlorate to chlorite. If we add an oxygen, so plus one oxygen, we now take that, we take chlorate and we add per at the beginning. Okay, so we add this, this prefix per becomes perchlorate. So this, this indicates the oxo anion. Oxo means it's an anion with oxygen in it. Okay, that's why it's called an oxo anion. It's an oxygenated anion. 
So the oxoanion with the greatest number of oxygen atoms is given the prefix per at the beginning and then ends in eight. So perchlorate has four oxygens, regular chlorate has three. If we remove one, we get chlorite, which is ClO2, and then we can remove even one more oxygen from that, and then we add hypo onto the beginning of it, and then it still ends in ite. So this would be like minus two oxygens from the default here of chlorate. Okay, so we get hypochlorate. And this works for any polyatomic ion. So we could do this with chlorate or sulfate or nitrate or carbonate or phosphate or any of those ones. This naming system works for it, okay? So a lot of these are on the back of your periodic table, but if for some reason there was one on there or there wasn't one on there, the default one will definitely be on there. And then you should be able to figure out all these other ones from the default just by adding or removing oxygens. So that's why it's very important to like memorize the, the default one because once you know this one, you pretty much know all of them, right? As long as you know how the naming system works. So very simple. Um, this little chart here just has a bunch of polyatomic ions on it. You have a chart on the back of your periodic table in the bottom left-hand corner that has a bunch, so you don't really need to use this. Um, all right, so they just give you some examples of where polyatomic ions are found. Um, sodium hydrogen carbonate, or also known as sodium bicarbonate, uh, is used in Alka-Seltzer tablets. Um, sodium bicarbonate, by the way, this is also baking soda, which is what you use like to bake with, so very common. Um, hydrogen carbonate, hydrogen phosphate, dihydrogen phosphate, these, these ions are very important in your blood. They regulate your heartbeat and they regulate blood pressure and stuff. Very important um, for blood and stuff like that in your health. Um, also for fertilizers, a lot of fertilizers are phosphates or nitrates. For anyone who, you know, does any farming, you probably know that. But um, yeah, so plants, these are, are these ions are used by plant roots to help them grow and, and absorb nutrients from the soil. So also very important. So, all right. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for the section. Uh, super short, a little bit of review. Hopefully, though, that helps you. And of course, you know, if you ever have questions, I am always available to email or, uh, or video chat or anything like that. So, all right, guys, um, hopefully that helped, and I will see you in 9.